for you tonight, which I'm very proud to present. Um, and this is someone who I've known for many years, and she's on her way up here. Will you please welcome Miss Kirsten Johnson? Woo! She's going to perform for you. Hello. This is just a little something I wrote recently after after a trip. Uh, Existential, existential crisis at the Museo Nacional Antropologia or city vacation, beach vacation, which is better, discuss. <laughs> You've just arrived in a city of 22 million people. And now, here at the Museo, you're joined by the almost tangible presence of possibly 22 million more people, people who had lives and now do not. And if the museo is any indication, they spent a good portion of said lives trying to stay alive, carving giant chunks of stone into toothy, tusky designed monsters to freak out their enemies or build lavish temples to convince the gods not to crush them or to send clouds of locusts sacrificing babies and bejeweling their tiny skulls because some gods might very well prefer, prefer a bejeweled baby skull to a lavish temple. It depends on the god. Correct. And all this to ask fate not to do what fate does, which is kill you. I'm here in a semi-omniscient state just by virtue of arbitrarily being in the present and being here in the present I can see that it doesn't work. All that effort and still you died. And ergo, I will too. Maybe I should have just gone to the gift shop first. Bought a not too overpriced jade, what have you. And then when things go dark, I could distract myself, look down and just go, oh, that's so pretty. But now, after the 18th ornate tomb, I find myself thinking, scooch over. I'm just gonna wait it out, Mayan style. This, I know, is not a healthy response. What would be a healthy response? Ah, yell. Yeah, bang something hard, eat meat that's been freshly killed, preferably by you. Find someone to, uh, you don't necessarily have to make a life, but dance around the concept vigorously, make something. My parents came to Mexico City on their honeymoon, trying to make me. They didn't. They made me a year and a half later. This time they both got Montezuma's revenge and tried to sleep it off in the middle of three competing all night mariachi bands. Ah. Poor things. Definitely. But, but. My dad would have loved the Museo Nacional de Antropologia. Always a sucker for the intersection of history and death. I fear I do not come from life affirming stock. But we'll see. Right. The beach. Puerto Escondido. <sighs> the waves are so powerful and when the sun is low it shines through and it looks like stained glass and the sunsets feel like church but almost everyone you meet is an idiot well i know this because well i'm pretty sure it's because i'm almost positive it's because they seem happy and relaxed. I'd want to know you'll be in that special chair over this there because here? this is just so all they can hardly get is to one chair. Never mind the other. I'm gonna try not to go into this Montenegrin or whatever accent that you do. Oh, that's right, you actress. She's wonderful actress. 
She and my play called Greg's Cookies. Man, you have to clap. Greg's Cookies, even if you didn't see it. We did it here with the wonderful ethical imp where we are. And Sigrun, the other actress, is, is, is here too. And was big success. Um, so yes, as actors, actresses have tendency to uh, imitate, you know, to constantly imitate. But I wanted to get back to this thing that you talked about there. Oh, I know. Have you read um, Yuval Noah Harari? Have you guys read him? He's the new guy. He's this. Oh, uh, yes. And you referenced him in the play. And at that point, I should. Oh, that's right. right. Oh, that's right. Well, okay. that's okay that you and didn't I go did. look him up. But he has a whole book about when you started talking about Mexico with ruins and got this whole it's it's a history of sapiens. So we are sapiens and his book is called Sapiens a History or something. Yeah. Very interesting. He's written yeah. all these books and he's a latest rich and he's a very accessible philosopher. Right? Anyway, that's just me yabbering on. So I was going to start out by saying I met Kristen many, many, many years ago when she was Ah, uh, how old were you when you were in Hiller's first play? It, when the, the piano, that was the piano, or the, um, the thing Peter was in, the... Yeah, um, 19, 20. It, it, you were 19 or 20, yeah. right? Absolutely. <laughs> and you and then you were in a scene there on that play, it, outside was Hiller Latoya, and the production was called This Is What Happens in Orangeville. And people in Orangeville got very upset by that play because it was called. This is they said, stop the play. It's called. This does not happen because it was all about murder. So they didn't yeah. like that. Yeah. But anyway, you were at the beginning, and you were a piano student, and there was a horrible, sadistic piano teacher. This is the kind of thing Hiller did. Yeah. In the lo in the lobby before the play started, yeah. and you were being like, <laughs> it was so scary and so horrible and so abusive. I loved it. <laughs> and you and you at nineteen were. Doing this kind of thing, and I wasn't going to ask you this about later, till later. But we were in this play that Hiller directed, which I want uh, Kirsten to talk about, Hamlet, Eight Hour Hamlet. Yeah. Right? And I was Claudius, and you were Ophelia. Yeah. And we didn't get to see Ophelia. Like she did this thing. And you correct me if you remember different. I know I'm now yabbering and not interviewing you at all. But <laughs> and then, and we're doing this thing where we never got to see Ophelia. We go like, what's Ophelia going to do? Because there's the mad scene, you know, she going nutty. And so we want to know what's happening. And then he would, and then he finally showed us. And what did you do? And what was that like? Oh, I what. Spitzy Sky is, yes. is saying that he, we didn't, they didn't get to see those other actors because we'd rehearse in yes. private. I, that's so I'm clear. Like doing the mad scene. He kept saying, you're going to see it sometime. Yeah. So I came out with a bunch of big basket full of rotting vegetables and just, just smeared them and smushed them into my face and my hair and my dress and my clothes. And so that was just, and it was like half an hour. It was a long <laughs> A lot of smashing of the vegetables, yeah. of the rotten vegetables, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, it really worked for me and for um, the queen, the woman playing the queen, because we were totally shocked when you came out and started smashing the vegetables. Yeah. Now, is it true, I know, personal, private thing, but did he actually ask you to put them somewhere else? Yes, he did, and I, yes, he did. Initially, he did, and I said, yeah, I can't. I I can't do. I won't do that. And how old were you at that time? Twenty one. Twenty one. So, but even at twenty one, and Hillary was somewhat older, like me, on my age, and and she stood up to this man and said, "I'm not putting vegetables." Well, we won't say, but we will. But Dinah, I'm not putting vegetables. But you should clap, but you must understand also that for me, you may not disagree, this is the relationship that direct, a good director has with actors. Yeah. They suggest things that are absolutely scary and crazy. Yeah. And you have stage managers also who help. But they sit these horrible things. And then an actor like you will come and say, well, no, I'm not going to quite do that. <laughs> right? But what you came up with with the smashing was so hard. And for me, it was like, well, Ophelia isn't just some pretty little singing the song, you know? Like, that's what you usually see with Ophelia. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, because Kirsten is a visual artist, and also she is a actress and um, a writer. You just heard her writing, and I'm sure there must be some other things. But some mm -hmm. filmmaking. Filmmaking also. I've seen your films. Your films are on your website, and they're so fantastic. 
Yeah. No, I mean, there was one during COVID that totally got me, helped get me through COVID. The one about the lady, just mention it, the lady with the thing you're not supposed to touch. Oh, don't, don't touch it. It was about, <laughs> it was about poison ivy, yes. That's right, it was about this lady. It was a tribute to Mrs. Howell and the Gilligan's Island. Oh, that's what you were doing. I didn't know what it was, but I loved it. And she was like this crazy lady who was telling you the how. But what I loved the most was she kept saying, you want to touch it. I know you. <laughs> You want to touch it, but you must not. And she kept like trying to touch it anyway. So you have to go see Kirsten's videos because they're quite... Okay, so now I'm going to be all intellectual and say, do you consider yourself to be a feminist? Yes, I do. Yes, good, yeah. important. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not a boring question. How does that manifest itself for you as an artist? Or is it that thing that's just unconscious here? Are you just by default a feminist in the sense that you're a woman and you're doing work and you're putting it out there? Well, I'm, I, I, I'm a woman who's doing work, but I'm also aware, I, I just naturally my inclination, my interests are, I tend to, when I'm painting, I tend to only paint other women. And I didn't make a conscious choice to do that, but I think there's a lot of men who, who, who make films that have only men in it and it's not, even an issue it's just right. like what do you mean there's a bunch of people and that's sort of what i'm saying the same thing what do you mean there's a bunch of people and they just happen to be women because <laughs> yeah and exactly. all of a sudden because they're women it's a thing like yeah. why are you painting the women and it's like well why are you painting the men why are you painting anybody of yeah. course why so, not paint the women yeah i mean there's just a it's just what what interests me and and if there is a huge amount of inequality and i'm aware of it is that the only way that it manifests itself in, in the subject matter of what you do? Like, I mean, because I don't think there's a polemic. And we talked about this with Hope last time when I tried to get Hope to tell me what was the point of her poem. So, I mean, I don't expect you to say, rah, rah, women. Because when I do the gay play, I don't go, rah, rah, gay. So I don't expect you to do that. But I, I don't know. I, I think partially it has to do very much. I would say subject matter is so much. Yeah. Like in the sense of, uh, in the sense of like what you choose to write about and who is the central part of what you're doing your thing you don't know what I mean because well the things like when my, my series of paintings uh cat fight was all about yes, cat fight the this is the stewardesses right yeah the stewardesses stewardesses cat stewardess. fighting but it was through a lens of like okay this is a thing this is a powerful cultural meme um but it's also uh stupid and ridiculous and let's Pope fun at it and well, I totally love it. Two of the models from Catfight yes, Secret and Angelique Carvalho are uh, here, and, and, and I, I used it for when you allowed me to use this publicity for one of my plays. Oh, that that right. thing, and I loved it. But what's interesting is some people would look at it and go, "Oh, why are we seeing you know women fighting?" Apparently, I don't know because this is apparently a heterosexual thing that live women wrestling. It turns on the men's; they get to you know the hard ones. But I don't have that. But apparently, so you do that, and it's Stuart is it's fighting, but it isn't made for that male gaze, right? Yeah. So it's an interesting kind of thing you're doing. Well, and it's funny because I have the, I have that film up on my on my website. And it's got so many hits, so many more hits wow. than anything else I've ever done. <laughs> but I'm sure that the majority of them are like people going like, ah, oh, this is not what I, this is not what I want. And then they, then right. they oh, really? right? because it's not, as soon as I start Oh, talking, they don't get the point. Well, they, they're like, no, I'm talking all the way through it about right. like, this is really stupid. <laughs> and I'm like, why is this a thing? Right, exactly. And let's analyze why it's a thing. I mean, it's still funny. I'm not making it sound like this guy, but. Uh, yeah, but I also think it's interesting because when, when we had Annie Sprinkle, right? Did anybody remember Annie Sprinkle? Yeah, sure. She's quite a fabulous sex trade worker in person. And she came to Buddy, she did performance, and there were some people who shall not be named who said, oh, there are men who come. If you have Annie Sprinkle, they, here I go, I seem to be doing a lot of masturbating tonight. <laughs> they will be there jerking off in the back row. And um, I remember Sue Golding, Johnny Golding, she is now my favorite person in the world. She's in England, she's amazing. She said, well, so what? There's a guy in the trench coat in the back, but I'm still, it's still what it, it, what she's doing. Do you understand what I mean? Like it, it, if you're gonna stop doing feminist work, because some guy might be jerking off in the back, then that, that's not do that. Anyway, I want to talk about something else. So this is a blatant question. Are you, Kirsten Johnson, a gay man? The only reason I say this is because what happened was is that when we were working on cookies, 
uh, we were talking, and at one point, for some strange reason, I happened to be looking at, um, was it to tell the tr- to tell the truth or something? It was an old American TV show. I happened to be looking at it, and I said, um, "Oh, there's this show and that, that you know." And you were like, "Oh, I've watched all of to tell the truth. Yeah. I've watched every episode." And then you talked to, to me about watching Betty Davis or something, and I'm going, "Are you a gay man? Like, I don't get it. Like, you you totally have you seem to some degree to have a gay man living in your body." <laughs> That's yeah, I just think, you know, can't, I'll bring back the feminist thing, the, the definition of being a woman is maybe broader. Absolutely. And, that's, and it includes watching every single episode of To Tell the Truth and What's My Line and, and uh, well, all the music. Of course, episodes. it's very broad. And, and, and I'll just end off by saying that I think that you were very, yeah, that you were very good friends with R.M. Vaughn. So we almost have a pause for R.M. R.M. Vaughn here. And that's a vlog. He died during COVID. We don't talk about. So we talk a lot, and of course, we must talk about the people who died of COVID. But there are people who died of lockdown, and I don't know if that's what happened with him. But there are several people I know who died of who were very lonely, and it was very bad. Anyway, RM died, and he was. A, a, he was. A, I knew him way back. You knew him a little more recently, but he was a, quite an amazing guy. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, well, I guess that we have to go on because um, I think that we have another show, more show to do. Could you please give lots of applause for Kristen Johnson? Thank you very much. What is Platter Lube? Platter Lube is a forward-thinking, water-based lube that's more convenient, environmentally friendly, and cheaper than the other guys. Platter Lube comes in chargers, which are water-activated custom sachets of concentrated powdered lube. Just add water and the powder instantly transforms into a super lube that's super slippery and without being too sticky. Each charger of Platter Lube has more lube than the other guys, and at about half the price. Or save big and get a full deck of Platter Lube, and it's got five chargers for about the same price as four. You can even get subscriptions and get Platter Lube discreetly delivered to your door and never run out. Go to platter.com to learn more and get slick with the latest technology for your lube. Live chat is available now at platter.com.